through mass robotics uh, and our event around additive manufacturing. Um, so my name is Tom Ryden. I'm the executive director at Mass Robotics, uh, and we're excited to be here this afternoon to talk to you about uh, a technology that is really impacting both robotics and the use of robotics in that technology. Um, part of what we do in these uh, seminars and these series is to try to bring uh, technologists together with customers and really uh, open up a discussion around how to use this. Um, this is part of what we call our signature series. We do a number of these events um, in different verticals. So we do one in logistics, we do one in healthcare, we do one in construction. This one happens to be on additive manufacturing. So we appreciate you guys being here. I'm gonna keep it short and turn it over to the guys who are gonna provide the content because um, I think that's the more exciting part. Uh, just a couple of things, we are broadcasting this. Uh, as well. So uh, folks uh, can watch it either now or later. It will be available both in some of our blog posts. We embed it in our blog posts. We also put it on our YouTube channel. So uh, we appreciate those folks who are joining us uh, online um, and live. Um, we have a lot of content to cover today. Um, so if we do have time, we'll do some Q&A. But if we don't, uh, please feel free to submit it. There is a tab on the GoToMeeting down on the lower right which allows you to type in a question. Uh, please feel free to put that in. Um, if we don't get to it, we'll either uh, share it with the, the participants or make sure we get a response to you. So thank you for that. Um, so first up, uh, we're going to start with uh, Peter Russo. Um, and oh, you're just gonna come up too quickly. I'm gonna do my, <laughs> my, my talk here. Um, so Peter is an entrepreneur and mentor. He has founded, built, and sold companies, served uh, on acquisition teams for venture-backed companies, and has been an angel investor. Um, he is formed, uh, he was formerly with the, or the Director of Growth and Innovation at the Mass uh, MEP, or a Manufacturing Extension Program. Um, there's an MEP in every state, um, and uh, he's worked here locally with Mass. He's also worked with some of the other states' MEPs, uh, so he's a great deep background in manufacturing. We're excited to have him. Peter, you're up. Well, thanks, Tom, and uh, you're being generous and you missed your slides here. So first of all, Ma Mass Robotics has a great mission. It's gonna help all of you grow your businesses. Don't forget to stop off at their website. These are the other people that I'll be talking today and you'll be introduced to them shortly. They're right over here. Say hi, yell hi. Hello. Okay. I love this statement. The idea basically is that 3D printing, which is one of the additive manufacturing, goes beyond, um, additive manufacturing goes beyond 3D printing, but 3D printing is at the core of it. Within 3D printing, 3D printing basically allows you to get complexity for free. I love this statement because it's the idea that a printer doesn't care. A printer doesn't mind if you're making the most rudimentary item or whether you're designing a very complex item. It also doesn't mind and doesn't care whether you're an, an, an engineer with a PhD or whether you're a kid in junior high school that happened to teach themselves solid works. So I'm gonna to talk to you, whoop, I'm gonna to talk to you about first the benefits, then the challenges, and then give you some best practices and co cover really quickly some very cool 3D before you get to see some really cool 3D that people are bringing here today. So relative to the advantages of 3D printing, I think everybody pretty much knows, so I'll go very quickly here. It's the rapid prototyping part. What you don't often think about is prototyping or rapid prototyping small bits and parts. So keep that in mind. That's a, your ability to do that. Then after you've designed and you've done your rapid prototyping, it allows you to go towards your print on demand. That's both for testing individual parts as you change your design, you can test, and also, in addition to that, it's the possibility of having inventory on demand rather than having to bring in inventory. This is particularly helpful right now with the with the supply chain issues that we've that we've had. Um, moves on to to prototyping being lightweight, um, and and particularly today we we have uh, some you know, there's some samples coming up and and shortly that show that kind of strength in certain types of 3D printing that's as strong as metal op opportunities while being lightweight at the same time. Fast to design, and oftentimes we think of this as fast to design. Um, the way I think of it, because I'm a manufacturing guy, is, is it's fast to design and get out to production. 
So normally you finish a CAD and you go to work on a machine, whatever that happens to be, a CNC and so forth, and you have to set it up. So you have set up time, you oftentimes have to change the design uh, to enter it into the system. You have to bring the system up to speed with how the tools are gonna move and so forth. And then in addition to that, you have that set up time, you have the person running the machine in relative to 3D printing. It's fast to that design, it's also fast into that production. Environmentally friendly, some of the real easy ones in environmentally friendly is that you're using only the material you really need. So you don't have a lot of waste there, but there's also energy savings. There's also people savings from the standpoint of someone doesn't have to stand there at the machine. So it's really an interesting thing. There's huge benefits and costs that come along with each of those things. Now, when you get into higher production, we'll talk about that in a second, but think about all those costs you save when you're 3D printing that you're not doing when you move into a, a normal manufacturing. I shouldn't say normal because 3D printing is normal now, um, but a, a, a manufa traditional manufacturing process. Then you get into the challenges. And I'll make a statement at the end of this that's kind of interesting and will be shown to you today. Um, there's limited materials, but the materials are changing every day. Uh, there's additional materials coming on board. In fact, I'll just state it now. The challenges in 3D printing are being eliminated every day a little bit less. They're reducing those challenges. There's more and more materials every day, and you have to keep your eye on this because it makes such a difference in how you're 3D printing, what equipment you're picking, and so forth. Restricted build size. Again, every time a new 3D printing process or additive manufacturing process happens, it tends to happen on a small scale, and then it goes bigger and bigger and bigger. And again, you need to keep track of that, but it's a, it's a, it's a, dis it's a challenge that's being overcome. Post-processing. Um, the numbers up through this year is that 52% of 3D printed items need post-processing. And people forget about post-processing. That's finish. Uh, sanding off burrs, finished work, and, and so forth. But it's interesting because, again, today you're going to see some examples where post-processing isn't even needed. Um, so that's being resolved in each of these. Next thing is large volume. Up till now, 3D printing, of course, it's for small volumes. There's starting to be some processes that aren't for just small volumes. Um, Jason's going to talk a little bit about using in production. Then you go into to part structure. This is still an issue a lot of times. I'm, I'm hoping that this is addressed today and someone contradicts me in their particular 3D printing. But still keep in mind, many 3D printing processes layer, which can delaminate at times under the right, under the right or wrong conditions, and others use material that's like material. Um, it's not that actual material that it's going to be in a production, but it's a like material and oftentimes can be brittle or the internal structure doesn't necessarily have the same um, solid aspect to it. So be careful of that. But again, it's changing every day. And then finally, design accuracies. This is still an issue um, in many instances. And a lot of that is because 3D machines don't necessarily have a standard. So be careful of what piece of equipment you're using. I recently saw somebody who said, gee, I didn't realize that the plate that my, my part is being formed on, if it's in a slightly different place on that plate, each of them is slightly different. And that discrepancy really matters. Now I'm saying that, and yet I don't know whether Jason brought an example of it, but he has some micro printing and you'll say, well, wait a minute, how can you say design inaccuracies and then see something that's so small um, that, that, that you can, won't be able to see it on this, on this camera? So any questions before I jump into best practice? Any quick question? All right, so I'll just jump into best practices. So how do you combat this? Over time, you won't have to combat it, but right now you do. You have to mentally, consciously remember these factors to help you, some of the key ones. Understand the equipment limitation is number one. People, again, you can't assume 3D printing is 3D printing is 3D printing. Machine matters. Plan your post-processing ahead of time so you don't suddenly have a huge cost or a process you can't do. Might also change which piece of equipment you use because it may be more expensive to make it, but it may be less expensive in its whole if you don't have to post-process it. Then design with scale in mind. This is my favorite of all um, because uh, 
uh, Jason, at least Jason and I, the, your other two speakers here aren't as old and gray as us. <laughs> but Jason, Jason and I have been doing 3D printing since 3D printing started. Uh, we remember urethane uh, 3D prints where they melted in your car trunk if you weren't careful. Um, and design for scale really was something we always had to pay attention to because we couldn't do any kind of scale. But today, people are used to doing 3D printing in some level of volume. You have to remember, if you're going to move from a 3D print to, say, casting something, it needs some draft. And if you're going to then move from, from casting up into injection molding, you need a parting line. So, so you know, there's nothing worse than designing something you really love or going to machining and you can't get a, you know, you, you can't get a negative curve on it. You, you, know, you, you want to be careful that you don't design something that has to be redesigned at each volume scale. Um, and the final uh, difference in materials. The materials really matter. Check, check out the materials. And finally, 3D printing for the sake of 3D printing. If anyone here ever prints, 3D prints a gear, they should just, just don't. I mean, <laughs> gears are so expensive to custom make and they're so cheap if you just design around gear sizes that exist. Very quickly now, because that took longer than I thought, comes down to keeping your eye on hardware, software, and materials. This is a game. You can't create the software until you have hardware that can kind of use it. You can't create better hardware until the software becomes better. You can't do the materials until they're both better because materials are based on volume most often. And, and that gets designed last. We are in a heyday of materials are finally coming out. Tremendous amounts of materials are being released at the same time. And it's causing this. This is, this is, these are just some of the processes. All right, so now I'm, I'm done with my benefits, challenges, and best practices. And I just wanna show you some cool stuff that caught my eye that I just think is really neat. So, so this is out of MIT. Um, they build sensors into a flexible 3D print. This allows you to make a robot that can actually sense the position that it's in. That's really cool. This is liquid resin at Northwestern that they said, we've got to make it a process that allows really big. This is bigger than a person. And it's, it's curing that fast that it can come out, it can come out of the tank like that. Oh, sorry. All right, so that's cool. Go to the next one, light sensitive resins. This used to take a long time. That's actually the process right there. Right in our backyard, um, this is a, a same person who, who worked on Voxelate, uh, Carbon 3D. They're creating, this is a great example of materials used in, in, in high, high volume inner sole on Adidas sneakers, um, cushions on helmets, football helmets. This is a really cool one. This, this is a projected image that cures the resin as the item is spinning. And that's a solid piece. No layering, no, no anything. And don't, you know, we, we, can't, we can't do anything if, unless you go big and go, or go home. So you got concrete and you got steel, a steel bridge being manufactured. The reason I showed those is because they use robotics. They actually use robotics in the 3D printing. There's, there's, you can see one through four here. I won't read each one off, but basically there's the same processes being used and our small scale boxes are being put onto robots and used in large scale in, in large things like aviation and bridges. And there's people already currently using this. You got Boeing, Rolls Royce, Pratt Whitney, and they're doing it because it, it, it's cheaper than milling out of a giant block. They are also doing added manufacturing to things like uh, um, expensive parts or parts that get damaged during production, get dropped out of the, out of the, uh, out of the mount, and you know, it, it, they're able to add metal back to it. Um, some of these methods have even been approved with aviation. And I, you know, just I thought this was really cool. Um, relatively space uh, makes a hundred percent rocket that uh, uh, can leave our atmosphere that's completely 3D printed. And because of it, they can put cooling systems in the shell to make the, the material um, a different type of material. It's cheaper and a hundred times fewer parts. Um, and the last thing I wanted to cover was. We haven't even started to talk about the future here. Um, 
3D printing goes to 4D printing. What's 4D printing? How do you have 4D? Um, it's the material itself has a capability. So if any of you dealt in the machining world, um, nitinol is a good example. You machine nitinol and it can, it can, you can machine it so that it changes its shape with a different temperature, for example. That's now possible in 3D printing. Watch this video, this is so cool. Those are 3D printed feet that have a memory. They are being electronically drawn back one direction, but they're then moving forward with on their own due to a memory in the material. It's so cool. It combined with um, flexible plastics with rigid plastics all being printed at once. Oh, I went right by that. If anyone wants history of it, go to the go to the report on it. That was just the history I I dropped in there, but I'd rather move on to 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 Jason. Um, known Jason a long time. We both come out of the toy industry originally, by the way. So, um, and so I, I have the privilege of introducing Jason, who's the founder of Empire Group. Thank you, Peter. Gray hair, Rob Common kind of got me a little uh, freaked out. <laughs> kind of hit me hard for some for whatever reason. Um, uh, thank you for letting me be here and uh, talk about my company a little bit and some of my experiences with uh, 3D printing. Um, click right into it. Um, in all honesty, we joke about this on a daily basis. Some of our best employees at our company are 3D printers. Uh, don't talk back, work as hard as you can possibly <laughs> imagine. And, and just keep on, keep it on. So um, uh, Empire is a company that I started um, about 20 years ago now, actually more than 20 years ago, in 1999. Um, it was a company, uh, it was a startup, like you guys uh, are all aware of and, uh, and understand. Uh, but one of the things in starting Empire um, that really, you know, I really took from my learnings in you know prior um, career uh, achievements was 3D printing. Uh, it's something that I've been geeking out about since uh, I, I first seen it. And uh, as soon as I could apply it to my company, I did. Um, and it was really started with, you know, FDM and on and on, but we'll, we'll get into that a little bit more. This tells you a little bit about um, this slide here. It tells you a little bit about the companies and, and, and things that we're doing today. Um, the company today is consumer medical defense mostly. Prior to that, it was uh, toy and juvenile. The three pillars of our company are design and engineering, prototyping, and production. Uh, we are a you know full service company, so we handle a lot of the upfront design and engineering. We help steer our com our customers into the right uh, technologies as well as the right paths uh, to create what they're ultimately trying to uh, achieve. Uh, on the prototyping side, this is an area of the company that the company was really uh, found upon, uh, and that's with you know rapid prototyping, high fidelity prototyping, and show models. Now on the production side, you know, we are in the short run production area of the business and in the industry. Um, we do a lot of CNC machining to achieve that, as well as a lot of 3D printing. This here kind of shows you, um, you know, kind of how we started and where we are. This is by no accident. One of the things that uh, Empire is really good at is really understanding our customers and what the customer need is at the moment. Uh, so back, you know, at the inception of the company in the you know early 2000s, it was really based around FDM to start. It was our first lead in just like it is now. We still use this technology to this day, but it was a big part of the company early on. It was what honestly, frankly, what we could afford to, uh, to prove what we're doing. Uh, and Polyjet, SLA and DLP. As the company grew, those things changed. They're still around. The only one that's still not around for our company uh, is probably Polyjet. And that's really because it's industry uh, and where that really hits. Uh, again, you know, uh, we like to think that we know exactly where um, these technologies work and where they don't work. Uh, they're ultimately another tool in the toolbox. Um, but as you go through here, things are changing. And this is what's exciting. It's like it's like a rebirth right now. Uh, and one of the first introductions into like that rebirth that uh, I got really excited about was in 2018 when we brought in multi-jet fusion. Um, this is just an incredible piece of technology. It is, you can call it it's like SLS, but it's not. It's different. It's a little bit more user-friendly. We use it differently. And as this is kind of from a, a business side of things, we look at it a little bit differently. Um, in this area, you can truly do uh, uh, production at quantity, at scale. Problem as, as a business owner, we're more specialized, more into niche technologies, things like that. So this doesn't really fit our, our business plan. You know, we're not really going out and trying to get, you know, 10, 15, 20 of these machines. What you really need to have to do, uh, you know, some volumes that matter. Uh, with one machine, two machines, you can do a, an awful lot. Uh, but we really like to use it to, to iterate more to get ready for 
uh, the people that want to take this to the next level and have 20 or so machines. That's 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 not our business. Um, incredible tool. Again, we are uh, we use this this we use this every single day. But we have definitely become super users, and the reason we have become that is we understand how to pack the builds and actually um, create um, builds that normally this machine is not really designed to do. Uh, it's really designed to pack the same type of material over and over again. That's where you get the most efficiency. We're using it a little bit differently. Uh, and then the most exciting thing was right at the start of, unfortunately, we want to talk about it anymore, the, the pandemic. Um, you know, we, um, we saw a technology that just bumped us on ahead. Again, a lot of this is around talking to our customers, understanding the challenges, trying to figure out, like, I mean, the other thing I always say is a buzzword is like, you know, we're R&D in the R&D process. And that's what we do on a daily basis. We're talking to our clients and like, what would change the way they're creating? And one of them, and I, it was just like the first time I saw stereolithography back in uh, 94, dating myself, um, was is, is micro DLP. It is just incredible. To allow uh, an engineer to iterate at this scale is incredible. And I was, there's an example uh, after this slide that kind of really talks about you know, a little case study and in, in, in what it did for one of our clients. But which coin is on that under that? Oh, that's a penny. Wow. Yeah, yeah. There's this stuff. Uh, yeah. Yeah. It's it's an incredible technology, and you, you literally you need a, a microscope to inspect and all that, and it's a whole nother uh, thing to talk about as a business owner. But uh, anyways, um, yeah, it's an incredible piece of technology, uh, and it's really. Uh, I mean, for us, it's it's made us relevant in this world. It's allowed us to go to some of our medical clients with a solution for some problems that they've had. You know. Um, over and over again, and we actually have a tool to actually help them now. And then the last one is really interesting. Um, the last one, for a long time, I have been trying to do rapid injection molding, like a long time. I have gone to clients and used other technologies and been embarrassed beyond embarrassed of failure <laughs> and, and never really got anywhere with it. Fast forward to a new technology that is a, a composite tooling, which I do have a, an example. It's kind of hard to see, but I can just pass it around after. And what this allows us to do is iterate with production grade materials, which to me is huge. Um, we have a lot of clients, again, it goes back to the client and what the client needs and their struggles. So to be able to iterate with the end use material is, is extremely uh, important in the medical world in a couple other um, types of applications, but medical specifically, um, it's, it's big. To be able to iterate, they can go test, drop test, all that stuff early on. Um, it's just it's just been an incredible tool for us. It's taken us uh, some time to figure out and find out its application, and that application is continually growing as the technology is progressing. So this is a, a very exciting uh, technology for us. We're we, we've taken it full on, um, and it's been a, it's been a great experience. It's been a fun experience, honestly, to learn. It's like again, it's like that rebirth. It's just incredible. There's a lot of other applications though for this that's coming, and you can see it here in this slide. Um, defense communication, including 5G, it all tailors around the type of uh, material that this machine can create. Sure that, that yeah, I probably should. Um, I think on the next slide, it might show, well, it gives a little bit, oh, it doesn't talk about this one, but some real world, world examples kind of going back uh, to what I was speaking to. Uh, one of them is this micro DLP uh, example. So this, uh, this client was seeking to create, um, you know, a device to physically deliver targeted treatments in patients. Um, something like this, you know, would be, you know, micro injection molded would take months. The cost would be through the roof. We able to quickly iterate every 24 hours, 48 hours at, at most to continue this going and going until they um, got to a design that they were comfortable with to take that next step. And that's really where that, that particular uh, tool and that technology really shined. And it's pretty much what all we use it for today. This technology can be used for manufacturing as well. Our company going again. This is just you know I'm I'm expressing how I use this technology. It's it I'm almost limiting it. I'm not probably explaining how much more it actually can do. I'm just explaining how we use it internally now. Um, the other one um, goes to um, goes back to this composite tooling, uh, and it's for you know in the food industry was another example where prior you know they're doing like materials. You know now we're able to provide you know it's a better mousetrap. You know, we're not using imposter materials. We're using the real thing to iterate, which is a pretty incredible thing. Uh, and it could be for sonic welding. It could be for drop test, a, a whole host of other things. Uh, what Peter was just speaking to is this project, which is very unique. This is a, a medical product for um, for basically looking at uh, cells under a microscope, right? Did I get that right? Yeah, okay. And uh, 
to do that though, you need production material. So prior to that, you know, you would be you're looking at months, you're looking at, you know, a huge expense. Uh, quickly, seven, eight, 10 days, you can quickly 3D print a tool and you can see the surface finish is incredible. There's a lot of different techniques you can do to it to, to improve upon that. And we're producing real parts. So we're iterating with this. And honestly, what's interesting about this particular story is we 3D printed this like we do everything else as a, as a quick check. Uh, and when we did that, it worked flawless. We're like, wow, this is great. You know, let's, let's 3D print the tool. We 3D printed the tool, started running shots, and we found problems. It was weird. It's the opposite of what you would think. You would think that the 3D printer would fail and that the production side of it would be good. It kind of bumped us on the head. We're like, wow, this is operating a little bit differently because the material is sli sli slipperier. Um, the way it goes together is much different. you got shrink rates. There's a lot of things to consider. So th the 3D printed almost gave us false sense of uh, the ability to go to production. And uh, this was actually corrected us and went, oh, we need to change this a little bit, ultimately to give our customer a better product. Uh, and at the end of the day, they'll be able to take these short run. So again, with this technology, we can provide, we don't like to go much more than 100. You could do 1,000 shots. It's not about the tool. It's just that this is a manual process. Uh, again, the process is changing on a daily basis, just like everything else in 3D printing is right now. Um, but what it, what it can achieve for this particular client is incredible. 100 samples, 200 samples. She can go out and uh, show this to uh, her prospective uh, investors or whatever and uh, get some traction. So pretty cool, uh, pretty cool technology. Um, where do we go? Okay. Yes. Like, you know, if you don't mean I interrupt everyone. <laughs> that's okay. Um, keep in mind, the reason that that's important is that the medical, the medical products need a particular material to be medical grade that is not 3D printable. So they couldn't have tested this in a 3D format. Um, and if they went to an injection molder, it would have cost $75,000 or more. This saves them more than $50,000. It's a fraction of the cost, and they can test it in the real material. When you're making a robot, keep in mind the environment that it's in. It needs chemical resistance and so forth. Make sure that your 3D printing process can take the chemical resistance. This is a nice alternative if you're making fairly decent sized volumes and you need that actual material that needs chemical resistance or heat resistance and it's not 3D printable, it's a, it's a, to me, to me, it's one of the holy grails is printing an injection molding tool. Yep. Yep. And this is just the start. I mean, honestly, this is just the start of this technology and there's a lot more to come very soon. Um, so uh, where do we go from here? Uh, I mean, we're going to continue to work closely and innovate uh, clients in our target markets. Uh, identify new evolving additive and prototyping technologies, which is something I love to do. Uh, partner with OEMs and product innovators to optimize uh, new technologies and scale across additive technologies and low volume production. That's what our future looks like. Is that any questions or anything uh, you feel the answer? Or? Do you have another sample up there? Um, this just shows multi jet fusion, it just shows the strength of it and things like that. You guys have feel free. I can show you some of that. Thank you. Great. Um, so thank you, Jason. Appreciate that. Um, the parts are here for those of you who are in the audience. Um, you can come up and play with them. I encourage you to do so afterwards. Uh, sorry for those of you who are online, but that's the benefit of being uh, kind of in, in person these days. Um, so next up, I'm really excited to have one of our partners, Nano Dimensions, talk about their product. Um, so we, uh, we partnered with Nano Dimensions probably uh, half a year ago, something like that. Um, and they're a great partner. We, uh, we're, we're looking to do a really cool project with them starting next year um, that we're excited about. So more will be coming out. Check uh, back in a couple of months about that. Um, but uh, I want to invite Robin uh, Good. Goodner, Goodner, good, I guess, sorry. Um, Robin has been doing instruction in many of the local universities here, Olin and, uh, and others, MIT, UMass Lowell. Um, she's now moved over to Nano Dimensions where she leads their education and research department. Robin, come on up. Thank you, and thank you so much for having us today. Make sure I get the right button. Wouldn't have guessed that. Thank you. Um, hi, everybody. My name is Robin Goodner. Um, it was supposed to be Dale Baker today, who is the president of the Americas for Nano Dimension. Unfortunately, he could not make it, so you're stuck with me. 
my apologies. Um, a quick background on me. Um, I did join Nano Dimension in April of this year. Um, I previously worked most recently at MIT and then also before that at UMass Lowell, Olin College of Engineering and Tufts University. Um, while I play a mechanical engineer on TV, my degrees are in music. So I actually have a um, master's degree in vocal performance, um, but I focused most of my educational career on uh, fabrication oriented academic programming. So running maker spaces, shops, um, partnerships, peer to peer curriculum. Um, I did some work with the Mass MEP when I was over at UMass Lowell. Um, and my fabrication specialties are essentially everything except for electronics. And of course, that's what Nano Dimension focuses on. Um, so Nano Dimension was founded in 2012. Uh, we shipped our first machine in 2016, and in 2019, we were about to go out of business. Um, we brought on a new CEO, who is our current CEO, Yoav Stern, and he went to institutional investors in the public stock market and raised $1.5 billion. And we have since been using that money to forward our mission, which is reinventing the electronics fabrication industry. Um, so one of the ways that we are doing that is by acquiring complementary technologies that also stand in their own right. So our flagship is the Dragonfly 4, which you will hear a lot about today. Uh, we also acquired the SM Tech, which is a pick and place company. So that's surface mount technology. Global Inkjet Systems, which produces the inkjet heads in many inkjet printers across the world. Um, we have a, an artificial intelligence company called DeepCube that is working on integrating artificial intelligence into our entire product line. And then we also have two micro DLP printers, um, uh, Fabrica 2.0, which is a plastics printer, and then the AdmaFlex, which it prints in ceramics and metal. So, We've already heard a lot about the benefits of additive manufacturing and the benefits of additive manufacturing of electronics are very similar. Um, so what we talked about agile hardware development, uh, greatly reducing the time to market. And of course, when we think about additive manufacturing of electronics, we come across that same benefit. Um, so we have had our clients reduce their product cycle time from six months of development to one month of development. Um, and you just can't achieve that kind of uh, time frame with traditional manufacturing. Um, of course, we also also have uh, geometry, which is a huge benefit of additive manufacturing. Unlike traditional additive manufacturing, we can achieve geometries that cannot be achieved with traditional electronics manufacturing. Um, so we will talk about that more in more detail in a bit. Um, but 3D design, when we think about PC boards, is something that is brand new to the market. 3D design leads us into miniaturization capabilities. Um, when one of the other benefits of additive manufacturing is keeping IP in house. So it enables us to, um, it enables companies to press print, go home, come back, and their IP remains in house. And then of course, customization of products, which we've already talked a lot about today. Um, the environmental impact of additive manufacturing electronics is similar to the environmental impact of additive manufacturing, but it is even more stark when you compare it to the environmental impact of traditional PCB manufacturing. Traditional PCB manufacturing is a very dirty process. It is environmentally horrifying when you get down into the nitty gritty of it. It is wasteful, dirty, chemically hazardous, and requires a lot of water and space. Additive manufacturing electronics has very limited waste, just like traditional additive manufacturing, uh, very limited chemicals, hazards, and of course has a much smaller footprint. Now we can't achieve vo the volume with that smaller footprint that we can with traditional manufacturing, but it's a start. We also have the impact of complete electromechanical systems. So not in our current iteration, but if you think about the next generation of our machine, we are incorporating the ability to place active components in the boards as they are printed. So what we get is complete electromechanical systems that can be taken off of a build plate. So if you picture pressing print, coming back the next day, maybe two days, and being able to fly a drone out the back of your printer. So how does it actually work? Um, so the Dragonfly has two print heads. Uh, it is an inkjet technology and it prints two different inks. So we have a silver nanoparticle that acts as our conductive ink and then a dielectric ink, which is FR4-esque. So we get into the problem with 3D printing. Whoops. We get into the problem with 3D printing that it is not exactly the material that we use in traditional manufacturing, but it does have similar properties. 
there are two different curing technologies within the printer. So we have IR and UV curing, one for each uh, ink. And it is, of course, a 100% additive manu uh, process, manufacturing process. And so I talked a little bit about what it means to think in 3D with electronics, but we're really talking about completely reshaping the form factor of uh, PC boards. So instead of a traditional, call it 2.5D PC board, so we have a 2D layer, that connects via vias to another 2D layer. And so we build up this stack, uh, it's kind of two and a half D. We actually have the ability to route traces however we want to within the board. So instead of having 90 degree turns from via to trace, we can just do a diagonal trace. We can have a coiled pair of two different traces. If you have traces going from one component to another, you can coil the traces together to get from one to the next. So the possibilities are really endless and only just starting to be explored. So some unique additive manufacturing electronic circuit capabilities. Uh, the first group grouping is a vertical integration of ICs and chip test board. Uh, we also have side contacts for plug-in mini boards. So you can see those side contacts on that board in the middle are completely continuous throughout all of the layers of that board. And then we also have inserted and side mounted components. So you can see in that third picture, we have resistors and capacitors that are inserted into the middle of the board and no thicker than the board. Uh, and then they also are inserted side mounted into the sides. We can also print some passive components. Um, so we haven't been able to print active components quite yet, um, but we can print capacitors, inductors, and low pass filters. Um, so you can see on the left, we have 55 layers of parallel capacitors. And then on the right, we actually have a more efficient low pass filter than can be manufactured with traditional manufacturing today. We also have the we also have access to very unconventional 3D um, RF designs. Um, so some of these can be manufactured. They're just very, very difficult to manufacture and both expensive and time consuming. And then some of them can't actually be manufactured at all. Um, so we have miniaturized conformal antennas, 3D phased arrays, 3D helical antennas, 3D multiband, multipolarization antennas. Don't ask me what any of those do. I have absolutely no idea, but I can connect you with someone who does. Um, so I just wanted to explore very briefly one of our really interesting customer use cases. Unfortunately, most of our customer use cases we can't actually talk about, but I'm allowed to talk about this one. Um, so one of our customers, Hensolt, converted a standard PCB, um, a PLL board, into a 3D high-performance electronic device. So what they did was they took that original board, um, they completely rerouted the traces, and they took advantage of both traditional manufacturing techniques and additive manufacturing electronics techniques. And they actually created three 3D boards that all stacked together via vias and created a cube stacked solution. So you can see the x-rays of their final product. Oh, no, that moves. And you can see as this rotates around, there are three different layers, but the traces are 3D within each one of the individual layers. Questions? Time for questions? All right. Yes? How is, and I apologize for not knowing your company well enough to ask this question, but can you send in, are you a service or do you strictly sell the machines? We are a service. Um, short answer, yes. Long answer, we should talk about it if you're interested. All right. Thank you so much. And Robin forgot to say that she's got samples here as she well. She has lots of samples. Um, and so, and I was just, while she was talking, I was looking at them and they were fascinating. Um, it's amazing what you can do now with 3D printing. We're hearing a little bit more about that. Um, our next speaker is going to continue on that, that theme. Um, so Jordan Kalmar is the application engineer uh, at the US uh, uh, section of 9T Labs. So 9T Labs is based out of Switzerland. Um, but they've opened up an office here in the U.S. Um, and uh, they were formed in 2018. Jordan's going to be talking a little bit about what 9T does, so I'm excited to hear. Jordan. I'm just going to grab some of these parts and maybe chat about them up there. Okay. Remind me for a second. Okay. Yeah, no worries. Excellent. 
All righty. So, hello everyone. My name is Jordan Kalman, and I am an application engineer at 9T Lab. So, as was mentioned, it's a Swiss company, and now we've opened a U.S. office. So, myself, I'm from Canada, but I'm not far off. I I studied in Toronto. So, previously, I was working at Pratt and Whitney Canada in our additive division. So, we have some good additive of metal flying and we had some good discussions there, but I was working heavily on our composites and mostly our thermoplastic comp composites. So that's what we do at 9T. Um, so here, let's go ahead. So again, we were founded in 2018 and it was an ETH Zurich spinoff turned startup. Uh, we currently have 65 employees in house and we're rapidly growing here in the US in the greater Boston area. And we're Series A, and we're kind of moving along. So we've secured 22 million for funding, but we're moving quickly. Thank you so much. Great. So just as previously mentioned, it's all about the material. So one of the materials we really focus on is this continuous fiber thermoplastic material. So there's a lot of really great properties. So going back to robotics too, and additive just in general, there's robotic 3D printing, but it's additive manufacturing. So automated fiber placement and automated tape laying. So AFP, ATL, that's really where it's all started in the 1970s and 80s. So those machines still today, they'll make your large uh, structures. So fuselages, wings, you name it. So those are still around and they use continuous fibers, but there's a huge debate and there has been for decades thermal set versus thermal plastic. And even still today with additive, uh, all the resin based systems are UV curable thermal sets for the most part. There's some differences there too, but then there's also the filament based systems that use a thermal plastic. So you can remelt it. It's not cured with heat. It, you can remelt, it softens. There's end of life consideration. So same is true with these continuous fibers. At the end of life, if you can't, reuse your wind turbine blade or you can't reuse your wing from a thermal set composite you're kind of stuck uh, there are options but it's kind of the whole life cycle analysis to deal with that so we really focus in on these continuous fiber thermoplastics where you have this design freedom and you have this end of life consideration there's also again to that chemical resistance and corrosion resistance you have benefits from using say a semi-crystalline thermoplastic versus a a thermal set epoxy so that's kind of the high level so again what do we do today we look at these really big kind of shell structures that are stiffened so in the aerospace industry especially you have kind of rib structures that are protruded or otherwise manufactured and bonded to surfaces but there's a lot of challenges today with thermoplastic composites and getting those certified for parts yeah for sure no problem um so you see kind of here that's kind of what we do today. You can imagine very large structures. And for the thermal plastic side, that's really you're seeing kind of small stamp formed uh, brackets like clips, cleats, uh, these small brackets, but you really don't see these small, thick and complex parts that traditionally today are, are metallic and they're machined from, from a block of material. So that's kind of the question. It's like, what about these parts? Why aren't we using composites? And if we are using composites, where are kind of your pain points there and what are the issues? Uh, and again, I mean, there's other manufacturing. You can think of hand layup. It's still used more than people would expect today uh, for, for production, for high volume, but it's very tedious, suboptimal. There's a lot of uh, inspection and that goes into this and there's a lot of process controls that need to be implemented or else you can't get a part uh, certified and, and flying especially. So we're lacking kind of this automation integration with software and we address that as well. So I can introduce you to what 90 Labs offers. So our current product line, the Red Series, we offer a complete solution for structural thermoplastic composites. So we have essentially a 3D printer, it's a build module as we call it, and a compression molding machine. We call that the fusion module. So we have our own software. We use quality materials. So we use materials that are already qualified, say for aerospace 
or in the medical industry and we use them with the customers. So we say, hey, what materials do you use today or what materials are on your roadmap, especially for sustainability for thermoplastics and we can bring those into our open material system and we make these kind of tailored preforms using our build module. There's plenty of parts where you can check the pre-molded and post-molded parts and then we use compression molding. So we use kind of an established manufacturing method and we go from there. We say, okay, if we already have a material and process specification, why change that? Especially for aerospace, it's very long to adopt a new material and process. So if we can already use those and show them a way to build a business case to manufacture something they couldn't make previously and cheaper and uh, a better buy to fly ratio, you say you buy this block of material and then that same block flies, that's kind of ideal, but you don't always get to do that. So that's where the additive manufacturing comes into play. So I'd like to introduce what we call additive fusion technology or AFT. And this is kind of the workflow. There's a short video after. So really what we, we give you is a software where you can use it with a FEA package. Right now it's uh, ANSYS Space Claim plugin. We call it FiberFi Design Suite or FDS. And there you can iterate as an engineer or anyone at a company can really go into the software and use a pretty, uh, pretty complex software, but learn it intuitively. So you can do kind of this finite element analysis, FEA with your part, do your fiber layup and send that right to the machine. So again, we're using materials. It's really the materials. So continuous fiber materials, we're using a tape that you buy these big sections of tape with unidirectional carbon fiber. So there's thousands of fiber and it's pre-impregnated. So it's pre-preg tape with the matrix material already holding them all together. And then we can slip those tapes. So you can go to a third party already. At the material supplier knows these third parties and you can slit into much thinner widths. So we actually use probably one of the thinnest <laughs> widths you'll see. It's under 1 16th of an inch. It's actually one millimeter tape. And we have continuous fiber tapes that we lay down. And our 3D printing, you can see in that image, we have two spools. So that top one is a spool of continuous fiber. And then the bottom one is a spool. It can be a neat polymer of the same matrix as the tape, or it could be short fiber filled. So we do a lot of high performance. We do peak, so poly ether, ether ketone, uh, but there's other family materials. So it's the poly aryl ether ketone family PAKE, and there's PEC, there's low melt PAKE, and there's others there. So most of my research and my thesis was about those. So, and there's a lot of uh, new possibilities with especially the cycle time. If you're using a low melting, high performance, uh, it still melts at over 650 degrees Fahrenheit or you know, 400 degrees Celsius, but it's uh, it's quite interesting there. And then the molding side, again, it's all about getting those surface finishes, especially with printing, getting rid of all those layer lines. And those layer lines, it's not just a, it's not really just a quality or appearance thing. It's really a mechanical issue. You have this low Z strength, those layers can delaminate, as was mentioned, but even deeper into the microstructure of the part, there's the voids. I mean, there's voids between each printed bead, as they're called, or extrudate, and you really just can't have those. So for a structural part, those are all stress concentrations and points for crack propagation. So you really need to eliminate that. In the molding, we completely eliminate those voids that you'll get from printing. And even more so, we can reshape fibers into positions that you couldn't do uh, otherwise. So we make these really interesting preforms. So I'll uh, show this video here. And I might talk over it a bit. This is the warehouse in Zurich. It's it's pretty nice to go there. And uh, this is showing off kind of the hardware that we have. So this is the uh, build module. And you can think of it as a filament 3D printer. If you're familiar with uh, any other machine that uses a filament, it's the same idea, but it is quite spe specialized where you have this workflow where you can design in continuous fiber reinforcement especially around holes. And I can show off these parts uh, after as well. You can take a look at this. Um, it's a helicopter door bracket. So you'll see kind of how strong this part is and showing off this 
more or less uh, batch printing where you can print these flat preforms and they're all 2D, but then you can reassemble the part and have like a 3D uh, fiber architecture. There's no other process where you can lay in uh, tape into these fine details, especially like a rib uh, section. So we also have this production suite where you can have a local network at your site at an OEM or supplier where you can have everything. Again, IP was mentioned. So same idea, if you want to keep all your IP in-house, you can do that with our technology and all your build modules are connected and all of your fusion modules are connected so you can see all the data and have all the analytics. So for this case, we print multiple parts. We also have these metal inserts, so just bushings, but they could be threaded inserts or anything and those are molded right in. It's not like the soldering iron into ABS or PLA, you really can't do that at all with this uh, type of material anyway. So they really need to be molded in and the polymer shrinks around that. And there's a lot of industry kind of experience there as well. So we just tap into that. So that's kind of the solution where we, we have the printing to make these tailored preforms. And then we have the, the fusion compression molding to get rid of all the surface anomalies and get rid of everything but more importantly it's reshaping i mean it's reshaping fibers out of plane and it even eliminates some of the the z uh, or z strength issues anyways so without getting into like too technical on that you can always ask questions but i'd just like to show some kind of part examples to give you an idea of where you would use such a tailorable you know continuous fiber technology so example one here is this motorbike uh, rear suspension rocker arm. I brought one up here. So I can show off the part a little bit just to give you the size. So this is one of the components here and there's, there's metal inserts in this one as well. So you can really see if you need a structural part, I mean, reshaping it's really important as well. Molding in the fibers, uh, and the inserts is really important, but you'll see, I have a video too, to show the reshaping. Uh, I can pass another one around. Yeah. Yeah. Is, what, what holds those in place? Is there a fixture that's holding yeah. the inserts in place? Yeah, so there's two that, they just fix two of them together. So on both sides, it's like, you can see a number two on the label. So they're just bolted through essentially. But are they held in place during the process? With a fixture? Ah, yeah. So usually you can, in this one, yeah, it's just on either a fixture, sliders, but some are just like friction fit onto the mold. Yeah, so we can pass one of those around. Yeah, so that one that you're passing around is actually uh, out of peak, but you can use a lot of different materials. It could be polyamide or others. All right, and then the next one, I mean, this is relevant here too, uh, kind of the exoskeleton topic. So we did quite a bit of university collaboration on this one, and this is for a winglet. So it's kind of on that shoulder mount. And the benefit here, I mean, you're printing fibers in plane, so you're printing flat, but then you're reshaping these fibers. So you have continuous fiber bands that follow the load path so you can really lightweight these parts and also you can fit it right to a individual use case so if you need like the small medium large exoskeleton you can just have those molds on hand and you just mold them and if you need to do some slight changes you can put in different inserts and change the mold so a lot of people say okay like we have to buy a brand new mold it's not necessarily the case you can have your base geometry but then you change your inserts and you just machine a new insert uh, for your mold so feel free pass that one too all right and uh, this is a good collaboration too so this is one that i've worked on uh, with purdue university so overhead bin brackets are pretty interesting you don't really see them or think about them, but they are structural parts that are in the cabin interior. And this is kind of hitting those higher volumes as well. So today, I mean, they're they're metallic, but we're looking at these projects where you can use, say, like a recycled grade thermoplastic chip material. So they call it like a bulk 
uh, molding compound, BMC, and you can just pack in these chips, whether it's recycled or whichever grade, and make a new part. The issue with kind of compression molded discontinuous long fiber parts, as they're called, is the scatter and their mechanical properties. You're laying in kind of these small chips with discontinuous fiber, so you'll get a scatter in the mechanical properties. So with this one, we 3D print a small kind of tailored preform loop that reinforces the holes and those two kind of ears, as we call them, and we can reduce the scatter. So we're working with Purdue. There's some videos online too showing kind of their testing. So they use a DIC, digital image correlation, to show you kind of the strain field and like how the all uh, molded versus like with the printed preform compares to show you know what to expect. So I can pass that around too. I think there's one over here or a few of these yeah, in the past. And they have the bracket too, it's good. So I do have some videos. We were just at CAMX uh, in Anaheim. So we had these at the booth to show for these parts. So it gives you an idea. I mean, it's hard to imagine. So I'll just show you uh, this first one to show you the workflow and I'll just kind of let it play here. So this shows you the actual building. So this is laying down one millimeter slit tape. We have a fiber guide and it lays down tape exactly where you need it. So it's actually a geared system. So not only does the gantry move like in three dimensions, X, Y, and Z, you have a rotational nozzle essentially. It's not a nozzle, but it's laying down tape and ironing them down. And when you take these kind of preforms to this molding stage, you're reshaping those in plane fibers out of plane. So you're really getting the full uh, mechanical benefit from the carbon fiber. And I didn't mention it too much, but this one is kind of showing you for volume. I mean, when we say compression molding, we're, we're shooting for actual series production. So we're looking at products that are on other other vehicles, for example. So we can hit like thousands of, we need to hit thousands of uh, parts. So in this case, production volume could be around 8,000 um, with aluminum as our benchmark. And we can reduce the weight, of course, we're using composites, so 50% weight, but we can reduce the cost because we're printing just what we need. We're not machining away material. And if you have an existing mold, you're just amortizing that one mold. Here's the other one. So this is for the interiors for the bin bracket. The reinforcement layer that you showed was that a different head? Which question, sorry? You had showed a reinforcement layer. Is hmm. that done by a different head? We have two nozzles. So there's one that lays down just the continuous, which we're showing, and then you can lay down the continu the short fiber fill. Yeah. And this one's quite interesting. So we print just that base loop and we reshape those into the ears. So we print just the minimum preform that we need. And you're left with a part that's 90% weight chip, 10% weight uh, printed. So, I mean, you can save a lot of costs there. And this is just kind of outlining how many of those could be in the cabin too. I mean, yeah, just gonna grab my water, excuse me. So as mentioned, this is a collaboration with Purdue that I'm, I've been working on for some time. So uh, this is again for high volume, like over 10,000. Aluminum is the benchmark and we're reducing the weight and the cost. And again, I mean, to get a part, to get material qualified and then go to get a part certified, it's a long road for aerospace. So this is kind of, going in the direction more or less with, if you're trying to get qualify this material system, you use a tape that's already qualified. And then if you want to qualify and then certify the process and the part itself, you're kind of using what's already there. So these DLF parts are already certified. 
So what are these kind of benefits? Uh, I guess very high level. It's about reducing the production cost. Even compared, I mean, in this case, it's machined out of a solid piece of aluminum. Uh, it's reducing the weight. So it's composite. So the density is already going to be half that of the existing metallic part. And it's really, we don't try to say, oh, it's like two times stronger or like 10 times stronger. We're going for, let's match the performance so we can really benefit from the, the cost save and the weight save. So it's really tailoring a part for a given application. Same thing here. This one is actually benchmarked against 3D printed titanium. So it's a little bit of an interesting one. So again, it's, uh, yeah, what are the benefits? So again, this is the winglet for exoskeleton. So this one's a polyamide that we also offer. We don't need, say, the chemical resistance uh, for this application or like the uh, high glass transition temperature of a uh, PEC. And again, it's reducing the cost and the weight and uh, mechanical properties are again the same. Yeah, sorry, I mean, I was talking all all week at Anaheim. I don't know if you could tell. Yeah. And um, yeah, this last part, again, it's it's trying to get to the, the production volume. So bringing the cost down is, uh, always kind of the challenge here too. It's like machining, but, and the metal inserts too, like the weight save is a challenge as well. But yeah, that's kind of the benefits are clear in this. Uh, yeah. So I'd like to show like a few more examples and I have kind of all these here as well to take a look at. <clears throat> So in aerospace, we have kind of this hinge we like to show. Medical, I mean, there's some alignment tools, there's uh, other fixtures, surgical versus, uh, we're not really doing implants, but I mean, that's down the road for certain companies and it depends where it fits. Thank you. And then automotive, I mean, there's lots of automotive and robotics were here today. I mean, it's no question that there's a lot of robotic application for structural uh, end effectors, pick and place, you name it. You can have a lot, uh, quadruped robots. So it's all there on the industrial and uh, collaborative side. <clears throat> and luxury, I mean, we're a Swiss company, so Swiss watches are uh, definitely uh, there for us. So just a high level view here. So when you're using such a process, you're really taking all the benefits of additives. So the agility, the rapid kind of prototyping. So when you're trying to make a tailored preform, you're not really stuck. You can keep iterating and really go from there. It's your, you can stay very cost competitive there. It goes into kind of the, low waste or even zero waste for a circular economy. Lightweighting, composites, it's a, it's kind of a given there. But that high performance is really crucial saying, okay, not only do you have the properties, but it needs to be qualified. So right now there's a lot of initiatives for additive through America Makes. There's also NCAMP, so it's a, the National Center for Advanced Materials Processing at Wichita State. They qualify composites. They've been doing this since the 90s, even earlier with NASA. But they also do this with additive. So they do this with like neat, like unreinforced uh, polymers. They're doing metals. They're also doing composites, but we're a bit of a different technology where we're almost the scaled down version of the robotics where we're laying down these tapes and we're getting our properties uh, from molding. So when they test big panels, they're laying down these tapes to make these larger panels and then they'll water jet cut or cut out coupons from this bigger plate. So we're in a different 
place where we're saying, okay, we can use a high performance material that already is established and has like some design allowables. And then we go in and we can do uh, more or less equivalency. So that's kind of the idea there where you don't have to start from scratch. You're kind of using the, the basis that is already there. There's no widespread additive database. It's very um, kind of niche and it's within the OEMs usually. So if there are like a Boeing or Airbus uh, material process spec or uh, design allowables database, they own it. The ones that are public are a smaller section and they're becoming more and more available. But that's kind of the idea to have it for the future uh, engineers and designers to have access to, okay, it's great if it's strong intention, but what about, you know, high cycle fatigue or elevated temperature or cryo? We're very familiar with materials that how they perform, but the additive equation adds to that. So you have to really uh, keep up with what's going on, but industry has really uh, made progress. And as was mentioned before, it's kind of every day there's improvement. So it's not a bleak like future. It's actually a very promising future, uh, really having those tailored materials for your application. Process speed too, I mean, we can just print what we need. So we print these small preforms, but we can use uh, traditional manufacturing, other grades of material. So we can really speed up the process speed, even like kind of going up with uh, using a, a bulk molding compound, you can bring it to scale. And biosource and recyclable is something we really uh, stand behind, especially a lot of my past research was on recycling end of life wind turbine blades. So traditionally thermoset fiberglass blades, they get landfilled. So we want to avoid that at end of life. So if we have that mindset with thermoplastic to give us the edge for being recyclable and then we can go and find biosourced uh, polymers it's great so i mean if we have time for questions i'll see if my voice can uh, <laughs> handle it what's the largest part you can use currently it's a good question so the printer everyone knows like build envelope so so about 13 and a half inches by 12 inch by six inch, so 350 millimeter by 300 by 150 or so. So, I mean, it's a, it's a sizable printer, it's a removable build plate, but the mold is really where you get the size. I mean, you can build larger parts. So I would say the mold envelope is more like two feet by two feet by as thick as you want, but it gets tricky. Okay, and can you do multiple parts in the mold if you print and then just do a single shot on the mold? Yeah, so most of our parts are like that. So we can put in the inserts, we can also put in a water jet cut laminate, we put bulk molding compound and multiple prints into one part. So it's always like a single molding step, whether it's single axis or two axis, it's done, yeah. Okay. Sure, go ahead. So what about lattice yeah, it's a good question. So when you get to those structures, we have some parts to show. You need to use the mold. So like your tooling has to have that, at least the kind of negative space to fit in the ribs. But we do that quite often. So you can put in a metal insert with that lattice structure. And if you want to iterate that, you can just change a single part of the mold rather than changing the whole envelope. Yeah, so I'll show you one of the, has a very small like lattice structure, like four hour process with very tight toe steering. Yeah, good point. Yeah, thanks Roman. <laughs> yeah, you could do both. So we use a lot of peak and peck. So, I mean, a lot of those are, already even for additive there's some good data out there for like the space application so you could take it right down to like yeah like negative 300 and like push it all the way to positive uh 400 they're usually kind of there in the in the fahrenheit range um but yeah that's kind of the idea where super stable and 
uh, big point being um, kind of the CTE, like the coefficient thermal expansion, like those are also very important when you have that mismatch. So our design kind of helps you work around that. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So if we can just design that right in with our, you know, it could be Ansys, it could be another uh, software to get both structural and simulation so we can really tailor that. You, yeah, no problem. Are you still strictly a service model or are you selling the machines? Yeah, so we sell the machines. Uh, currently, we sell that red series so you can buy the printer, the build module. You can also buy the mold. Uh, but we also do provide, you know, service. We have mold designers in house that will help you. You know, we're very familiar with our process, and we can work with other mold designers at a company to bring a new, give a new mold, like a, a old mold, a new life, or we can make a brand new mold or new insert. So we sell the machines. We also kind of sell this kind of in-house series production to make like a proof of concept build a business case and see if the company wants to adopt it or if they need to change uh, some material or something along the way, but it's very flexible. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, thereabouts, yeah, on our current build module and fusion module, yeah. But you need, obviously you can imagine, you either use like a larger laminate that is like water jet cut or you uh, pack it in, if it's a BMC part, you could just pack in chips or granulate, it's what you need. So uh, you can do kind of tailored loop preforms. You can imagine if you use the build volume and make a spiral loop, you can make quite a long part bigger than the surface area. So you can get kind of creative. And if you need a really long continuous loop, you can still do that and place it into the mold. Yeah. I mean, most of it's black, but that's kind of the benefit too. If using a thermoplastic, you can use pigments, and and that's well established. So there's other uh, there's other options for our customers too. Yeah, you can make it look uh, however you want. Yeah, it's not like the Ford uh, Model T. <laughs> great. great, thank you very much, everyone. And you can get into contact with me, uh, email, uh, LinkedIn, or uh, you can just call me. My number's there. Thank you. Great, thanks. All right. Um, our last speaker uh, is uh, Murat from Hathaway Robotics. And I'm going to invite Murat up. Um, we've known uh, Hathaway for, for a while now, and he's done some really cool things. Uh, through the pandemic, he pivoted and made um, what was a really cool uh, temperature monitoring system that we actually had installed here. Um, so during the pandemic, everybody had to check and make sure that their, their temperature was in the right range before we let them in the facility. Um, I am very pleased that we don't have to use it now, not because uh, the, the system didn't work. It was worked flawlessly. It's because now we've, we're kind of over the pandemic. But he also pivoted his business during that time, and he's going to talk a little bit about that. So, you're right. Come on up. No. Oh. Got it. Uh, my slides are short, so it's only like eight or nine. The ones that I send you didn't have videos, but if anyone wants to see the video, I can send them. Yeah. Uh, so today I'm gonna. My name is Murat, by the way. Uh, today we're gonna talk about the printers that made that confident possible. We call them non-planner, uh, automated non-planner 3D printers. They are FDM, uh, and I call the technology dinosaur because there's a bunch of other better ones, but there's still uh, a sector for FDM, I think. A uh, little of background. Uh, I founded the company in 2019, but before that, I had a, a FDM slash SLA experience since 2012, and uh, the core 3D printing technology development started in 2017. And right before COVID, we started uh, Robotic as a Service in uh, California and uh, Canada, uh, small businesses. 
we mostly focused on uh, material handling, uh, affordable for small businesses. And <clears throat> right around uh, March or April 2020, we introduced uh, comfort temp temperature monitoring products slash COVID products turned into a, more like a software thing now, but we still sell them. And today we're going to focus on comfort temp. Uh, and also we're working on the next thing, which we call uh, combining everything into one. We call software defined autonomous factory. That's not a good topic for this session, but uh, maybe in the future we will talk about it. Uh, I'm going to go over the robots that we did. They was mostly 3D printed, except uh, the large one. Uh, the standard ones, the medium and the line uh, load older models, they were mostly like 95% 3D printed using these printers that I'm going to show you in the next slide. Uh, we also did five or 10 factory inspection robots that had a couple thousand parts in them uh, for a chemical uh, plant. We also did some other fun things that didn't work, like a snow plow robot. <laughs> Uh, I see like a hold in one robots lately, but we tried it and work it was a bad business plan. <laughs> uh, I think there's no videos here, but oh. okay, so <laughs> that's still the render, but uh, it's getting close. We're not a 3D printer company, maybe we will be in the future, but not at this point. So the printer doesn't look like that. So maybe in the future at some point it will look like that, but it's still an engineering sample. We have approximately uh, 40 of them at the factory. Uh, so I want to talk about why it's unique, why we needed it. Uh, we looked into injection molding casting, uh, other methods that I can't remember right now, back in 2018. And I always had this idea about uh, automation and make our own stuff to uh, save money and save customers money too. So uh, this printer that we <clears throat> we designed and uh, thought about it back in 17 had to do high temp thermoplastics at scale because like I said, uh, like the factory inspection robot had 2000 parts in them and we had to make five of them, so it was like 10,000 bucks. And needed to work with a bunch of chemicals that most of the FDM printers back in that time couldn't handle it. And uh, uh, like that long robot was too long uh, for regular entry-level commercial printers. It was 54 inches long, I believe it was like 32 inches wide. So we needed to do real long parts, wide parts for our current robots and future robots. And we have put approximately 150 different designs. We keep making new robot and not making it. So the timing requirements were high. So the printer needs to run 24 seven without any human intervention. Uh, that's why our printers are unique, I would say. There's supposed to be videos each one, but it's not. Uh, 17, it was all aluminum, it was a really big one, it was like 36 inches wide by 36 inches high, and the Z, uh, I forgot to mention it's a, a belt style printer, so just like uh, we have it here, one a smaller one, it was an infinite Z, and that's the one that built the big robot. Mostly aluminum uh, frame, but we turned into steel. And within that five years, we build a bunch of different ones. Each one is a different version, but at the end, we have the probably the perfect one, which is the high temp one. And that's what we have at our facility right now. Uh, oh, I'm taking my notes. The, we turn it into a standardized set. So X and Y are standardized now. All of the printers that we're building in the future is going to be between 16 and 24 inches on X and Y. 
so we done build the giant ones. Uh, okay, the perfect example for this, and there's a couple ones like the robots that I showed you, but the best one I think is the Confitem, because we printed, I believe, around 55,000 parts using these printers, uh, especially that's this is that one that had uh, some of them had like 12 heads. Uh, and some of the confidence that we sold needed special parts, special filaments for it, especially food industry. Somewhere somewhere in Canada, uh, there's a big Canadian uh, mead manufacturer who wanted to buy these. But for some reason, there's a problem with the cleaning or each lens, they had to put gloves on and the material was melting at high temperatures because we were using low temp filaments. So we turned into the prices went up, but they were buying in uh, dozens at a time. So we turned into uh, high temperatures like Ultim. So we were glad that we already implemented high temp uh, features in the printer. Uh, I also want to focus on the injection molding. Right around COVID, when we had this idea, uh, we looked into casting, injection molding, and other methods. And I have my notes here. It was around, uh, actually, let's go to this one. So this device, this is the first day of production, by the way. It was, we're trying to tweak it, but we were all putting like between 100 or 150 uh, devices per day. And it had 15 parts. The biggest one was the screen frame. And we asked on manufacturer on um, protolabs.com, I think that's the uh, manufacturing on demand. And there's another big one I forgot. The each body was around $150 at 1,000 parts, and the lead times were around 40 days. And injection molding cost was around for the whole the whole thing. The tool cost was around $100,000, and the lead time was around two to three months to get everything done. So we had no choice but go with our printers. And we were lucky that we had uh, around five or 10 at that moment. So each frame body, which is that one, measures put in two, was around like $3 to make it. And it was around uh, 1.5 to two hours per device, the output. And these are the frames. Uh, not too big, but uh, bigger for off-the-shelf printer. Uh, oops, let's go back. Another important thing for us, we keep changing the design. Uh, you probably remember. We had a bunch of different, <laughs> hey, you guys probably remember. We had different, like probably like 10 different versions of Confitem. One had lights, one had different sensors, so the head was keep changing. So if we went with injection molding, we would make no money. Uh, but with our printers, we printed parts in thousands, not in millions. I'm not against injection molding, but uh, I'm just comparing them. Uh, we didn't spend any upfront cost besides reinvesting in printers and make more printers. And it was pretty fast. Uh, because it was running 24 7 and we had special <coughs> hot ends that we developed along the time to, uh, to catch up with the demand. Uh, <clears throat> and we're moving to, like I said, the software defined autonomous manufacturing, which is, I don't have the slide here, but uh, combining our robots and the arms that we're buying and our printers to make uh, a website where you can just upload your the whole product with X amount of parts and at the end you will have your uh, part within a couple of days. That's the idea. Uh, that's it. <laughs> I guess. Any questions? 
is that because you couldn't find any printers that would do both the size and the speed? What was the reason that you size might? and automation? I think there are printers, but they're too expensive. A couple okay. million dollars to just find one. Let's say, I think turn mode was one. It was like five feet by ten feet, uh, like real large machines. Okay. But it's too expensive. And now, are you selling the printers as part of your business, or is that mm -hmm. more of a you developed it to build your other products? We work with on-demand manufacturers. There's a couple startups in South Coast that we're working with, but not at that time. Yeah. I was thinking to sell it last year. Went to Rapid. Yeah. To see what's going on, I feel like 3D printing market is still s small and slow. <laughs> so maybe in the future. Yeah, I'm just fascinated. You can decide. I love people who say, "Well, I can't do it. I'll just build it myself." Right? <laughs> yeah. Another you know, question. Great. Well, thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. So that wraps up. Um, we uh, have some for the folks who are here. Obviously, uh, we have the folks who talked and they'll be around. We have parts. Please come and see some of the really cool parts that are here um, and uh, and the discussion. That's the important part of what we want to do. For those of you who are online, um, thank you very much for joining us. We're going to break now. Uh, I do want to say a couple of things. Our next event is coming up on uh, November 9th. Um, this is around investment. Um, and we're specifically looking at corporate venture capital, the trends in CVCs, um, and then we'll do a fireside chat with uh, with Sherwin, who is Sherwin Pryor, uh, who is now currently directing the one billion dollar Amazon uh, in Industrial Innovation Fund. So it's going to be a fascinating insight into what he's investing in, as well as the, how, how corporate investors are looking at the robotics market specifically. Uh, so we hope you will all join us for that. Uh, thank you for attending and uh, look forward to discussions afterwards. Thanks, guys.